Good afternoon. Today I'm talking to the lovely Maggie. Hiya Maggie, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, thank you very much Donna. Thanks for having me on your uh, podcast. Yeah, my name is Maggie James. I write psychological thrillers. Um, I've been a full-time novelist for about just over six years now. All my books are standalones. I've got a bit of a thing about not writing the series. I like to start a fresh book with new characters and everything each time. Um, Absolutely loving it. My next book should be out this summer and I'm hoping to release another title by the end of the year. So busy, busy, busy at the moment for me. Um, have you always wanted to be a writer? Oh, yeah, always. Yeah, when I was a little girl, that's all I ever thought of doing. You know, it never occurred to me that, you know, I couldn't just grow up and become a full time novelist as an adult. You know, that was my dream. You know, I used to write stories as a child and, you know, I was very focused on reading and everything. So, yeah, that was my dream. So, of course, when I became an adult, I became an accountant because <laughs> by the time I reached, you know, like 18, I, like many people of that age, I had no confidence in myself. I hadn't a clue about, you know, how to become an author. It was all very different back then, you know, we're talking, you know, several decades ago, unfortunately. And, you know, I just had no idea how to go about. We didn't have kindle publishing or anything like that this wasn't the setup there is now so i just, you know I, I went into accountancy and that stayed my career for nearly 30 years and all the while it niggled away at me i knew i wanted to be a novelist and it was it was really eating away at me that i had this dream and i you know it, i wasn't doing anything about it and that was annoying to me i was fulfilling other ambitions in my life like wanting to go off to travel i was going off traveling i was doing this i was doing that and i was getting on with my life and fulfilling my dreams but not when it came to being a novelist and in the end i just got so fed up with procrastinating i just thought well if you're not going to do it you know just forget the whole thing but if you if you want to be a novelist just go for it you know stop saying you want to be a novelist and actually write things so I think that's what happened in the end. I just ran out of patience with myself and uh, better late than never, as they say. I actually, you know, I've been full time now for just over six years, wrote my first novel. I started back in 2010 and never really looked back. Yeah, I've never regretted making that leap. It's been fantastic. And um, what made you choose crime fiction and psychological? I don't think I actually chose it as such. You know, I got this idea for a novel, wrote the novel, and then decided what genre it would fit into. And along the way of writing that book, I found that I was really attracted to examining complex emotions. And, you know, obviously something that can engender complex emotions is crime, you know. So rather than the crime itself and doing police procedural novels, I like to set the action around a crime and how people respond to that crime and I just found that fascinating I'm quite quite interested in sort of a layperson's terms in psychology and how the mind works so it's quite interesting to examine topics like forgiveness revenge um, that sort of thing so that's kind of how I ended up slotting into the psychological thriller suspense genre and but writing a lot about crime as a side product yeah I guess they come together quite yes, easily they yeah they do for me like I say I like you know thinking about certain crimes like my fifth book after she's gone was all about arson you know I became interested in the sort of people who are compulsive arsonists and what could make them behave like that and you know how people might respond to you know the crime of arson and having their home burned down things like that so yeah I find that fascinating <laughs> Um, which of your own books would you like to be a character in? Oh, good one. Um, I do terrible things to my characters. I'm not sure, actually sure I'd want to be any of my characters. So I think I'd have to be a minor character who was, you know, just sort of helping things out. I don't think I'd want to be any of the main characters. So let me see. I think I'd be one of the nice guys. Maybe in Deception Wears Many Faces, I would be the part of the best friend, Caroline, perhaps, you know, because nothing bad happens to her, you know, she just sort of sits on the sidelines and, you know, sorts things out where, whereas that doesn't happen with the main characters, you know, bad things happen. So. Yeah. <laughs> See, I always think this is the right answer to that question. When I speak to crime authors, like, would you want to be any of your books? I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> so yeah, no, no, I do terrible things to my characters, you know, and that's great fun. You know, I have 
great fun torturing them. So, yes, I don't think I want to be any of the main characters. I really wouldn't. <laughs> um, no, definitely not. No. You wouldn't have a very long life expectancy either, would you? <laughs> well, no, you know, you'd, I'd either die or ask other terrible things. You know, a lot of my characters get kidnapped and, you know, then held hostage and terrible things happen. So, no, it doesn't sound good to me at all. I'd have to be, I don't, yeah, definitely one of the bit players, I think, you know. <laughs> um, do you hide any secret jokes or messages in your books that only a few people would understand? um oh interesting question I've never been asked that before um the answer I think is no because um I'm quite big on in writing fiction that only things that advance the plot forward should be in the plot really so I think if it's a like like a secret a joke or an aside that only a few people will get then the majority of people obviously aren't going to get it and they might think well, what's this doing in the book you know it doesn't further the plot and everything so I think it could actually backfire so I'm not I'm not saying it would never happen but to, so far I've not done that like I can't really see that happening yeah that's um that's an interesting one sometimes people are like yeah of course I do you know a, a yeah. name or something but a lot of people are like no we don't <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, yes, I include names, you know, I've, I'm quite happy to include people's names. I think the world, my current work in progress has got five friends' names in it, but their characters aren't in it. I just, you know, I ran a competition and said who would like to be a character in my book, one male and one female, so it's people like that, but the characters are nothing like their characters, it's just using their name, which is a bit of fun for everyone concerned, really, but again, that's not really like a secret message or anything, that's something a bit different, I can't see me doing that at all. Um, what's the most interesting thing you found out when doing research for your books? Oh, research, I mean, yeah, you can, I'd hate anyone to look through my browsing history great times and all authors would say that I mean I've had to research when I when I wrote Blackwater Lake it was um, the de decomposition rates of bodies in cold water I mean that's that was great fun you know learning all about that but I think for me the most interesting was going staying with Blackwater Lake was hoarding disorder um, I got the idea for the whole book simply by watching a TV program about hoarding disorder and it fascinated me because I'm the complete opposite my house is very minimalist you know it's just very very sort of you know empty space and that's the way I like it I'm just the complete opposite of a hoarder so to see these people who you know that the houses were filled to the brim with you know debris and you know stuff that they saved for years and years and years it was fascinating to me you know I'd sort of delved into it and you know what can precipitate hoarding disorder and everything and that gave me the idea for the book you know what would happen if deep in one of these hordes was a clue to an ancient murder you know um something that took place like about 20 to 30 years ago and I thought, mm, yeah I like that idea and then whole whole thing spiraled out from there so I found that great fun to do very very good the research I probably didn't like was for deception wears many faces it was all about con artists you know love frauds who you know to con innocent people particularly you know um, someone they're wooing out of huge sums of money without you know any conscience whatsoever and that Yes, it was interesting, but, you know, it didn't make for great research. You know, it's quite heartbreaking what some of these people went through. Yeah, yeah, that's awful. I hate those stories. Yeah, again, I watched a TV programme which sparked, you know, the idea for that book. And some of the stories were heartbreaking. And, you know, some people got conned by people they'd known for decades who they thought were close friends. And, you know, often money was involved, you know. Uh, particularly with some of the scams but yeah not good at all no um do you have any phobias and would you write about them um not really sort of full-on phobias I'm not very good with heights I'm okay if I've got something to cling on to and I feel safe um but I can't I can't really see how that would translate into something in a book I mean yes you could have somebody with a a severe phobia of heights and something about the plot could happen around that but I'm not sure not great with spiders either so and again you know even more so I think than heights I can't really see how a phobia of spiders you know it's not at the moment sparking any plot ideas for me so I don't think so no no 
I mean, yeah, possibly with heights, but not not with our eight leg of friends now. We'll be putting those in a book anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, please don't, because I like your books and yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to. The other complete no-no, which I think a lot of authors would agree that doesn't go in a book is anything bad happening to animals. You know, do what you like to the humans, but don't hurt the dog. Yeah. Yeah. I messaged someone recently and uh, said about why did you kill the dog? He's like, someone was just completely, you know, mutilated and murdered. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely fine. Yeah, they're just humans, you know, but don't hurt the dog. <laughs> it's like, you people are mad. I know. <laughs> don't murder yeah, we're mad. <laughs> no, but that's very common, though, in sort of like social media readers groups. Everyone says, do what you like to the human characters, but don't hurt the dogs. I mean, I, I couldn't go to sleep the other night because I was reading a book and a dog got shot in it. And I, I couldn't go to sleep until I found that the dog was going to be OK and he was going to survive. You know, was, you know, never mind the fact that it had also been humans being murdered and terrible things happening to them. It's like, oh, no, the spaniel's been shot. <laughs> Oh well, yeah, I know. I, some people I can never forgive. Yeah, just unacceptable. <laughs> no, completely, that's a complete no, no. Yeah, that will never be going in any of my books. No, nothing bad's going to happen to the animals. The closest I came was in my second book. I did have an animal put to sleep, but the animal was eighteen years old. So, you know, I didn't didn't feel quite so bad about that, about that one. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, are you friends with lots of authors? Yes, both in real life and online. I mean, I, I do think authors generally are a very friendly bunch because it's it's such an isolating profession. You know, we just sit on our own in our office, tapping away our keyboard and everything and don't talk to people for days. So it's actually great to talk to other authors because they get exactly what it's like. You know, they get the stresses and the strains and on the one hand how wonderful it is and how soul destroying it can be on the other hand so I'm not I'm not a big one for going for like book fairs and book festivals but I have been to a few so I've met some of my favorite author friends in real life and others you know we get on great online and everything people like Tony Ford or Andy Barrett you know the great guys Malcolm Holland Drake you know some of the the great names in crime fiction at the moment they you know they're great so yeah I, I treasure my author friendships because like I say it can be difficult for other people to get what it's like being a writer. Whereas other authors, you know, they know exactly, you know, what it's like. Um, and do you get much feedback from your readers? Um, question. No, I haven't actually. I mean, yes, it's obviously the feedback you get from reviews online, but direct one-to-one -one feedback. For me, I don't know if it's the same for other authors, that doesn't happen very often. Sometimes when I send out my monthly newsletter, people will, re will reply and they'll make comments and stuff. And obviously, you know, when my book goes to uh, beta readers and stuff, I get feedback. But generally, no, I don't. Um, so I don't know if that's typical or not, really. But um, no. I mean, sometimes, yeah, people make comments in passing on social media. You know, if I pop up and make a comment, people might say, oh, you know, I've read such and such of your books and really enjoyed it. But that's about it, to be honest. I don't tend to get direct feedback in the form of emails or anything like that. Yeah, I think um, that is quite common, actually. Um, yeah, it's a question I ask um, all the time. And I think um, even though... I know I try and encourage people and I know others do to contact authors because you know you need it um but I still think people are too nervous to because they think you're too busy or whatever so that. yeah I've heard people say that they don't feel that you know that they can contact authors that authors are like remote figures who you know they couldn't possibly approach we're just human like everyone else you know we're not I don't think the majority of authors that I know they're very friendly and very approachable you know we're not remote creatures you know working and living in an ivory tower so um yeah now it's interesting to hear you say that but other authors I don't know if it was just me I don't know hard to tell really yeah I mean you can't all be Tony Ford uh, with his big head and his big following <laughs> can you <laughs> <laughs> oh you're going to be in so much trouble with him for that <laughs> yeah. it's fine i'll take to his face it's fine 
I'm a yeah. blisset, so it's allowed. <laughs> oh, well, I have a fellow blisset as well, as you know. You know, I love Bliss and Chandler yeah. series. You know, I think he's a great guy. In my view, he ranks up there with the best of British crime fiction writers, you know. He so, does. Yeah, you know, I've said that to, to Tony. So anyone watching this interview, go and read Tony Forder's Bliss and Chandler series. They're great, really good books. Yes, I second that, absolutely. And then you become a blisset. Then we can yes, get Tony exactly. onto the merch and it become official. Yeah. And yes, yeah. But well, we, we need Blissette t shirts, don't we? And sort of badges and things like that. We'll have to get Tony on the case about that. I want yeah. a Blissette t shirt. Yeah, we nag him um, quite regularly. So eventually we'll break him down, I think. Yeah. I think, yeah. Maybe. I'd let <laughs> yeah. him tell us to sod off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Tony, you can never do that. <laughs> He does frequently and laughs about it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, we need to go and sort him out. Yeah, that's fine. I'm totally up for a road trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, you, me, and Naomi, we'll go on a road yeah, trip. Absolutely, yeah. it's Sorry, done. It. <laughs> Naomi, yeah. we're going to Peterborough. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Um, well, the one I'd really like to spend a day with is definitely Stephen King. You know, he's just my idol. I think he's absolutely amazing. You know, the, just the, the sheer volume of his output and the quality just amazes me. But the only problem is, I think if I met him, I'll be so overall that I'd probably just faint, you know, I'd do a fangirl thing. <laughs> so I'm going to go with a sensible option. I'll say Peter James because I've actually... I've, I've met him in person. I've also interviewed him from my blog and he's a lovely, lovely guy. And, you know, you talked about, you talk about spending a day with him. Well, yes, I think you'd need at least a day because he's such an interesting guy. You know, um, I was just bowled over when I interviewed him because he's, he's led an amazing life. He's got his fingers in so many pies, you know, he's interested in motor racing cars. He's, you know, he's really, he likes me, loves animals and everything. So we could talk for hours about animals. And I think he's got a, fl a flock of llamas or something like that, or alpaca or something like that. He's got some exotic animals, you know, I'd love to chat to him more about his past career in film and, and television and things. So yeah, I'm going to go for Peter James because I can't think Stephen King would, um, I don't think he'd uh, he'd spend the day with me, but maybe you know maybe nobody asks him. You know, perhaps he would be open to the idea. Who knows? Yeah, nice trip to America as well. Get to see around would be great. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm mad keep on foreign travel. You know, so you know, bring on the end of lockdown so I can travel again. And definitely, you know, I've got a, an American road trip on the on the on the horizon you know so might as well because he he's over on the east coast you know he's lived all his life in Maine so I could just fly into the east coast start you know go and spend the day with him and start my road trip even better yeah sounds like absolute perfection I might just have to tag along in the booth yes. or something just so I can yeah. overhear what he's saying but you know not get in the way if you don't want to. <laughs> I got this image of me now driving along in a pink Cadillac and you're on the boot sort of knocking on the on the let me out let me out just drop me a sandwich every now and then I'll be fine <laughs> oh, I don't know about that I'm not that generous <laughs> pay you for it <laughs> yeah that sounds like a plan actually yeah should we include Naomi as well the three of us can go on a road trip yeah, I think she'd be great fun. And then we can just yeah. talk about Tony so his ears just burn constantly for ages as well. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, good plan. We'll get that sorted. But then his head will be even bigger. It's big <laughs> enough already. I don't know how he keeps it up. <laughs> no, I, don't. I think he's got like a steel spine in his neck or something, a steel rod or something. So... Yeah, he must do. I don't yeah. know. Bless him. <laughs> Bless him, yeah. <laughs> he's going to kill me. It's actually gonna kill me <laughs> yeah he's probably gonna kill me as well mind you i'm all threatened to kill him as well so yeah yeah it works both ways it's, it's it's said with love, isn't it it's said with Absolutely. love yeah and Absolutely. admiration and everything else yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah we're bliss sets yeah exactly you can't get rid of us otherwise no one to read his books <laughs> <laughs> everyone should read his books definitely Absolutely, and then you'll fall in love with Bliss as well. I not really know why, but you just do. He's, yeah, he's a very intriguing character, I think. You know, I, I like the fact that, you know, he's not terribly politically correct. You know, he's um, he is the way he is, makes no apology for the way he is. You know, there's something quite, not, quite nice about that, I think, you know. 
and he's yeah. not the standard police officer you know who's um oh, okay he's got a tragic marital past but he's not like divorced and with a drinking problem you know so he's not he's not cliched in that sense or anything and i love his interaction with his psychic chandler that's that's always fun you know the way they bounce things off each other some of the bits in the latest book are just so funny it's sort of oh yes <laughs> There's one particular bit we're probably thinking of the same bit, you know, where Chandler stitches him up. That's very funny. Yes, very. <laughs> He's such a sod. <laughs> and obviously the dusty ball sack, which we can never forget. <laughs> <laughs> that has become legendary. Yeah. That, is that was leg- in the acknowledgements as well, wasn't it? That wasn't even in the book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it's just like become, if you're a blissette, you know, it's become kind of legendary that sort of thing so I like to tease Tony with that particular phrase every now and again oh yeah me too it has to be done he wrote it so he can hardly say anything (laughs) (laughs) oh he does frequently it's just we don't listen yeah that's that's a fair point actually (laughs) (laughs) Um, so what do you like to do when you're not writing um definitely foreign travel I know I can't do that at the moment but big thing for me is traveling abroad and I've got a I've got a bucket list of what I would like to do over the next 10 years um so traveling is is top of the list when things are you know back to normal um I like going away for weekends um camping things like that I like driving I like cooking love cooking anything to do with food so going out for meals restaurants and things like that again you know bring on the end of lockdown so I can go out for a nice curry somewhere like that yeah I'm starting to get um more into like sewing and embroidery and things like that so same sort of creative stuff but you know something different from writing I tried my hand at doing art for a while and I was terrible you know I did try I tried so hard and I've got no artistic talent whatsoever there's a reason I don't design my own covers you know I used to get so frustrated because you know I had in my in my head you know this beautiful art you know, artistic thing which is going to materialise and really it was just a load of splodges, you know, it was bad. So, but I like trying my hand at new things like that. So I'm hoping I might be better, more better at sort of sewing things like that. Um, do you get much chance to read? Yeah, I read as, you know, as much as I can, you know, because I think that's really important as an author to read a new genre. So, yeah, and I've got Kindle, I'm a member of Kindle Unlimited, so... I don't have a television, so that frees up plenty of time to read. Um, so, yeah, I read as much as possible. Yeah, um, reading a good book. I've switched to historical fiction at the moment, reading a good book about um, possible um, so- solution for Jack the Ripper murder, which was good. Yeah. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I need to broaden my genres, actually, because I'm a bit become quite limited, I think, in what I read. I tend to read like mm-hmm. crime fiction, psychological thrillers, and not much else I used to read more widely so I think I need to branch out a little bit I tried, did my toe in sort of you know some light fantasy reading recently and that was quite interesting not these huge great thick books which are full of orcs and dragons and things like that it was a bit more low-key but it was good so yeah it's probably more sort of classical books I should read as well you know don't read um War and Peace just don't do it yeah <laughs> no no okay I'll take I'll That's take nice. your advice on that. yeah yeah it's not worth it <laughs> I lost a month <laughs> of my life to that book <laughs> life too short is it <laughs> my god it just doesn't end it just keeps going and the Russian names and oh my god yeah That's yeah all right yeah I think I could probably get through the rest of my life without reading that one yeah, I could probably give you the highlights, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like lots of bad things happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's war, and then there's not war, and then some people fall in love, then there's some more war, people die and shit, you know, it's pretty much the gist of the that's story. Good, then, yeah. yeah, that's it, you know, summarised in a couple of sentences, I don't need to worry about, you know, losing a month of my life, you know, reading it. Yeah, see, this is a service I provide for you all. <laughs> I know, um, we're all deeply grateful <laughs> you, should do that. you should sort of take these uh, sort of like the classic books or you know any book really and just sort of summarize them in one sentence <laughs> yeah. that's very unlike me actually I'm rubbish when I do uni assignments and stuff my word count is 
way over so yeah. I'm very poor at summarizing things and saying things in as few words as possible yeah no I think you did really well there on the war and peace <laughs> there's not much more to say oh that's how much I like someone... yeah no I'll think about this <laughs> yeah I was, I was joking with somebody recently I was doing that with my current work in progress because I was editing in it and within a week I lost 12,000 words and I was joking that it was going to get down to a paragraph and then the sentence of a sentence would be people get upset about being adopted at the end <laughs> Fortunately, I managed to start. I didn't quite get down that far, but yeah, it was getting a bit alarming because I was chopping words out at the rate of knots, and I'm thinking, I'm going to have to send to my editor at this rate. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to my friend about a blurb, and she's like, um, "There's this, and then shit happens, and people die, and that's how blurb gets it done." <laughs> <laughs> that would make a great blurb. Imagine if you're browsing on Amazon and you say, "Oh, that's, that's an interesting cover. Let's read the the blurb." Oh. Shit happens, people die at the end. <laughs> uh, yeah, it didn't make me laugh. I'm like, yeah, I like it. It's good. Go with that. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what's the last book that made you cry? Um, I tend to cry more at films, actually. But uh, I think the last one that almost got me in tears was a Stephen King book. It's 112263, which has got to rank as one of the best books I've ever read. And the ending was absolutely perfect. Because he gets criticised. Um, well, I've read criticism of his endings. He doesn't end his books properly. But I mean, certainly this one, it was just like, that, you know, the whole book was absolutely mind blown. And then it did have a perfect ending and it was just wonderful, loved it. I gather from the way you're nodding, you probably agree. God, it's such an underrated book as well, and not many people know about it, and yet it's phenomenal. It's so good. Absolutely blew me away when I read that book. It was, yeah, it's out of this world. The whole premise for the book is intriguing. It's just like, I mean, it's another one of his books that you could use as a doorstop because it's, I mean, just in awe of that, how, how prolific he is, you know, he just cheering out books which are the size of a small brick, you know, and, it's, and they're absolutely amazing from start to finish, you know, there's sort of twists and turns in that book and the sort of, like the, the colour of, you know, the sort of, the way it invoked that period in history was just amazing or that period in American history was there it was amazing yeah for for a British person to read is 50s uh, late 50s early 60s isn't it America yeah. I and, think they go back into the 50s but then obviously yeah. the action takes place in in um, you know the time of the assassination so it's early 60s so yeah it's... yeah and to feel like you're there you know when you're yeah. a British person that's never been to that part of America and you know and it's that far back in you're like that is some writing yeah it's, yeah it's, he's, he's very good at, at invoking small town America I think you know because he's always going on about like the signs on the shops and it just the color is he gives and like notice boards and billboards and but in that particular one, 11, 22, 63, is going on about sort of people doing the Lindy Hop and the dancers that were doing the music they're listening to. Yes, it was just, yeah, I felt I was back in time, you know, and I wasn't, you know, I, I definitely wasn't around in America at that time. So, uh, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> um, Post lockdown, you have one country you can visit, one concert you can go to, then on the, any other event, what are you going to choose to do? Oh, post lockdown, bring it on. Country, I think, like I said to you, I've got this bucket list of, you know, 10 top destinations. So I think it's expanded to 11 or 12 by now because it keeps growing that I really want to knock off before I, you know, before I, um, before I die, to put it bluntly. And uh, I think for me, it'd be the Arctic Circle. So it's not so much a country as an area because I've been down the other end of the world. I've been to Antarctica. And so I'd love to go up to the top end and go to the, you know, to that area. So Svalbard, perhaps the Canadian Arctic around there. So that would definitely be for top. Um, I'm going to pass the concert, bypass the concerts. So that's not really my sort of thing. Um, events. Um, I think it would have to be my wedding next year. <laughs> I think my fiance would probably kill me if I said anything else, to be honest. So, um, yeah, again, we're sort of looking at getting married in, in Greece next year, which obviously depends on lockdown being lifted before we can book anything. So I think, yeah, that would be the event I choose. So, yeah, a wedding in 2022, preferably on a Greek island. 
sounds like absolute heaven <laughs> it does yes yes it's uh yeah that'd be that'd be fun i think particularly if we do something like get married on the beach or on a we're talking about getting married on a cliff top or something then if he gets his vows wrong i can just push him off you know so. <laughs> <laughs> might be the shortest marriage ever this <laughs> Uh, and how did you meet him we met in a curry house you know I mentioned earlier about I love food and everything we just happened to we went to a, a, an event there's about 20 people there and he was one of the attendees and we got chatting hit it off pretty much straight away um saw each other a few times after that socially and then lockdown came in so which obviously put the the kibosh on on things but we we kept in touch on whatsapp you know sort of message we started messaging most days and everything when the lockdown the first lockdown ended we got together again as friends and then you know we had a chat one day and decided you know we could see if we can make a relationship work so and uh well, now we're engaged so yeah <laughs> yeah that was one of the nicest things to read during lockdown was, yeah. was getting engaged a lot oh. Good stuff can still happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I think a few people, because there are loads of comments on that post, and people are saying it's really nice to sort of get some good news in amongst all the gloom and everything. So, yeah. Yeah. And we made you cry again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it took a few people by surprise, particularly my family. You know, probably went, what? We didn't expect that. Didn't see that one happening. <laughs> well, it keeps them on their toes. Well, that's right. You know, I like to, you know, like to spring surprises on people, whether it's things like, you know, I remember telling my parents, I'm giving up my nice, safe, secure job as an accountant. I'm going to go travel around the world for a year, you know, so it's, it's always fun to, to do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah it's fine. They love it, really. I think maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure about that one, you know. Um, I think both of them were, yeah, both of them had passed away by the time I, it was like, I'm going to give up my nice secure job as an accountant and become a full-time novelist. That would probably have, uh, <laughs> what <laughs> are you doing? <laughs> but, uh, they, uh, they were both, my, both my parents died by that point. So there was no sort of shock horror reaction. Everyone else just probably thought, oh yeah, <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, just checking the list that I sent you. I don't think there's any questions I haven't asked you. No, I think we've we've covered quite a lot of ground, haven't we? With a slight diversion to uh, being a blissette and Mr. Forder and everything, but yeah, that was inevitable. I think that was always yeah. going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think uh, Tony knows he's prepared for that sort of thing. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, see how no. much trouble we're in later. <laughs> Uh, he doesn't know where I live. I take he doesn't know where you live, so uh, he does. But I know where he lives, so mm, yeah. I think I'm safe. He knows generally. He knows roughly the area I live, but he hasn't actually got an address. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He has my address, but then I have his address, so yeah. it's fine. So when yeah. we go on a road trip, I know exactly where we're going because I really do have his address. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's probably just about to move house, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's actually talked about moving, so <laughs> <laughs> probably not to avoid us. So I think I suspect the, the motives were probably, you know, genuine. They're like, oh, I want to move house. Right? Oh my god, I must hide from Donna and Maggie. <laughs> they're complete maniacs, and you know, I'm not safe from them. Yeah, I like to ask my authors what their limits are on stalking. I think Tony's <laughs> was as yeah, no, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> I think Tony's was as long as you don't I don't uh turn up and stand over his bed while he sleeps and that's fine <laughs> <laughs> well that's that leaves you a hell of a lot of scope to be honest I mean, so yeah okay so you totally can't, turn up yeah you can't stand over his bed while he's asleep but you sort of you know while he's watching football you know he's, he's laying on the couch you know pint of Guinness in one hand and we sort of knock on the window Whereas I think Mark Tilbury is generally quite terrified of uh, his twisted annies and that we're going to go up and hobble him. So, <laughs> Don't blame him. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure where my limits on stalking are. Um, I think they'd be a lot tighter than, than Tony's. They'd be more <laughs> sort of down Mark's end of the, the stalking thing. Fortunately, it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, perhaps I need to add this question into my interviews, actually. <laughs> Where's your limit? One. That's a good one. Yeah. What are your limits on stalking? <laughs> yeah. I need to know. It's important. You know, if I'm going to be stalking everyone, then yeah. 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 You know, 
you know, if people you've got that vision, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because people are muffled. Yeah, yeah, I'll ask you next time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be I nice mean, if there would be a next time. Yes, oh, absolutely. So talk about it next time. Uh, what are you working on at the moment and what is coming next for you? Right, well, I've just um, sent my eighth book off to my editor. So just uh, waiting to get that back. So... And I'm also, while that's with her for editing, I'm going to start plotting number nine. And I've got no idea what number nine is going to be about. I think like most most authors, I've got, I've got a list of possible novel ideas. So I'll just work through it and see what I fancy, fancy working on, which leaps out and hits me the most. But the current one is, like I say, it started off, it sort of went into like adoption syndrome and people who, you know, find it difficult to cope with the fact they've been adopted but actually the original premise was started out with um, a woman who whose mother dies very suddenly so there's an autopsy to find out why she's why she died suddenly and as a as a side effect to that they actually found that the woman's never actually had a child so you know and but the woman then goes to like, check all her birth details and she's got her birth her birth certificate and everything is as per normal there's no sign of any adoption record so she needs to find out what's happened so it's it's kind of like adoption but with a mystery sort of woven in as well as to you know how come she ended up living her whole life with this woman as her mother when the woman had never actually had a child so that's where I went with that so mm -hmm. awesome I can't wait <laughs> yeah it should be out yeah I haven't got a publication date yet but you know obviously I need to see exactly what my editor says and things like that and do the usual thing about you know getting the cover sorted and everything but yeah the plan is during 2021 is to release two books so while that's with the editor I will plot the next one and then get that written and that should give me enough time by the end of the year to, to get number nine because there's, there's been too long a gap between books for me I mean my last one was published December 2019 because all of last year I really lost most of my motivation to write you know I don't know if other authors felt the same way or think I don't think it was like Covid related I just you know I think it was a little bit of burnout which lingered and lingered and wouldn't go away but anyway things better now so you know I'm definitely back on the writing trail and given that there's been such a big gap I definitely want to get two releases out this year and then move on to next year at least another two next year so make up for lost time <laughs> yeah well yeah. your back catalogue's there to read if anyone hasn't read them yet and I would highly recommend that they do so thank you, thank you. yeah they've been well they've all been fun to write they've all been very different they've all posed different challenges sometimes I like to set myself a challenge with each book I write and then there's there's one book I wrote I'd, I'd read that oh, it was really difficult to write an entire novel in the present tense so I thought well, I'm not sure about that so I'm going to give it a go so that was that one so yeah I tend to like to set myself many challenges with each one too you know which is all part of learning really I don't think you ever stop learning as a writer you know hopefully with each book you get better and you refine what you do and how you, how you do it so yeah we shall see be interesting to see what I pick for number nine. I've not got a clue what's going to be about at the moment. Could be anything. Perhaps I'll do stalking. Yeah, well, you know where to come. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I know my own personal stalker. <laughs> well, I can be your stalker as well, but then you need to, we need limits. So you need to decide yeah, on your true. limits first. I need to decide on my limits. Yeah, I do think I'm more like sort of down the Mark Tilbury end of, you know, oh my goodness, no stalkers. I can't have a stalker. <laughs> well you've got the bonus that I don't have your address but I have marked yeah. so yeah, you've already true. got a, an upper hand yeah bless him yeah. yes I think we might have to keep it that way <laughs> yeah we'll see yeah I can we'll trick, yeah. I can trick yeah. anyone into giving me their address it's fine <laughs> yeah I'm sure you could I'm sure you could and I'm sure you'd be the nice kind of stalker anyway so yeah I just want to tell you how good you are I mean what more could you possibly want exactly yeah exactly <laughs> um so before we go would you like to tell everyone where they can find out more about you and where they can find your books yeah sure i'll just give you my website address it's a nice easy one to remember it's www.maggiejamesfiction.com so there's all my books there including all my audio titles as well so yeah i'll say that again www.maggiejamesfiction.com 
I'll put um, a link to that when I post a video as well. So that would be great. Thank you very much, Donna. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, you too. It's nice to finally meet you at last. Yeah, so we, we've known each other as well, like Facebook friends for a while, you know, sort of trading, you know, various sort of insults over Tony and things like that. But yeah, it is nice to sort of put a face to the name and everything and actually connect, you know, almost in person. Yeah, close enough. It'll do. Yeah, Zoom, Zoom will do, do for now. Yeah. yeah I mean, do you, go, do you go to book fairs and festivals? Is there a possibility that if I turn up at one, I might meet you there? Um, well, I haven't so far, and then I got to know so many authors, and now I'm dying to go to any. I'll go to any. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just a question of when they start up again, you know, because obviously that's that's been critical.